I don't know about all of you, but I was really impressed with that introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for those that, for the kind introduction. Greetings, all my relatives. I'm so honored to be here today in this special place. I, I look around and I see it as a symbol of courage, bravery, resilience for a group of people in our society who were deeply harmed by our wrongful assumptions about each other. And now it stands an, as a symbol and an inspiration to all of us that we can overcome brokenness and despair and harm if we work together and believe, believe deeply in the idea that we are one, Namuyut. We are one. I'm, I've, been, I've been so inspired by many Canadians across the country uh, um, in the last few years, but in particular following the uh, final report of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm. By far, most of the Canadians that I've met have heard something about our broken past our um, historical secret between us. And most of them have, uh, have expressed an interest to reconcile, to do something. As a matter of fact, the last poll that came out said that more than eight out of 10 Canadians care and they want to reconcile. And it's really amazing because I, I think about the day I sat uh, uh, in a room like this in Ottawa, when the Commission, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada submitted its final report, and I remember so clearly how excited all of us were. There were many of us survivors there. And, and uh, Justice Sinclair submitted his report, and there was a part in it where he said, Canada, you have done all this and you have effected genocide on the Aboriginal people of this country. And I know the room erupted in euphoria and we hooted and hollered and clapped. We were so happy we couldn't see through our tears because we were overjoyed that someone somewhere had finally cataloged all of this historical wrong and said, it's true, we've heard your story, now we know that it happened in this country of ours. And I went home that evening and I thought about it, I went to my room and I thought about it and I thought, oh my goodness, someone just said that we have committed cultural genocide upon the Aboriginal people of this land, and a great sadness descended over me. The euphoria and the joy was lost in that moment, and I thought about us, all of us, Canadians who now live and work and play here in this country, and I wondered about how we could ever move beyond that moment, to acknowledge that moment and to be able to say like this, uh, and there was a previous poll before the eight out of 10, that seven out of 10 Canadians agreed with the characterization. More importantly, seven of, out of 10 said they, and they said the same thing, wanted to reconcile. And that's absolutely amazing. I thought, you know what, there are most of us Canadians care and we want to do something. And I, I know I'm speaking to the converted, that's why you all came here today. And it's people like yourselves who are gonna make the difference. Usually when I talk to other groups of, of people, I say, who are we in this room? What is our deepest essence? Why are we here? 
And it's a metaphor that's far greater than just our physical presence, this moment in this room. It's about who we are as human beings, why we were born to this place and to the places that we come from. And I don't think it's any different from one country to the next. We're all born to a purpose that is creator designed in the first instance, and then we're given the will, the free will, to design individual purpose, and we pursue those, all of those things. I know in this country we had a bad experience with colonization, and we lost our way together as Canadians, and because we were colonized and assimilated as Aboriginal people, we lost our way to some extent, to a large extent and we could no longer pursue that individual's purpose. But there, there was a, there was a um, salvation for me when I recognized that even for parts of my life when I couldn't pursue my individual purpose, that I was nonetheless still fulfilling this great universal purpose that the Creator gave us. And what I'm really saying is that all of us in this room, all of your children, all of your siblings, all of your relatives, have purpose and value. And that's one of the things that I find incomprehensible about humanity sometimes, that we tend to denigrate the purpose and value of ours, of, of yours, of mine. But now we stand in a pivotal moment in Canadian history, this is one of the most exciting times, if not the most exciting time in this country, where we now have the Truth and Reconciliation Report, and we have other documents that are now going to guide us moving forward that will inspire us to live side by side and to be able to respect each other and hold each other up and live together in peace and harmony. You know, I've been watching, I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm getting old now. I've been watching for a long time Canadians. Uh, it used to be easy to sing, single out who I was angry for about my, my experience in residential schools. I'd, uh, and I'm saying the term uh, respectfully, I'd hate the white person because they were responsible for everything that ever happened to me. Then I watched as the face of Canada began to change Everybody on earth is here. Every color, every race, every creed. And what I fear the most is if we don't nurture that, that there could be other experiences like the residential school where hatred and prejudice and racism manifested so deeply that an entire group of people was almost destroyed completely. So, so you all have an interest in reconciliation. Of course, it's about us, it's about Canada, it's about our history, it's about Aboriginal people, but more than that, it's about you as well, moving forward into the future. We need to be caring for each other, embracing each other, celebrating our div uh, diversity, and for, and for those who have come from far away places, sing your songs, dress your dress, be who you were meant to be, as well as in addition to being a Canadian. I used to, I used to get upset and, I, uh, upset, and I didn't know a whole lot about immigration, but I, I knew that our uh, government, our country, wanted to invite immigrants to come those who were only qualified. And I, and I thought, well, that's important, but they should always also encourage them to come for who they are, for all that you are. The very first reason that you thought you were born into, carry that. The initial values that you had, carry those. The world's views that you came with, carry those. And if we did all of that, Canada 
would be such a powerful country with this melody and sym symphony of humanity all saying, yes, we are one and we celebrate it. That would be the strength of our diversity, our difference, being able to embrace that and, and being able to celebrate it. When I was a little boy, I was six years old, they took me to one of these residential schools. I remember that day so clearly. I don't remember much about all of the other 11 years I was there, but I remember that day my mother had me by the hand. She was walking, to me, walking toward the school with me. She never said a word. We walked up these steps, 10 steps, walked into this long hallway, and there was a strange man waiting inside the door. My mother handed me over. She never said anything, she never explained why I was there. She didn't say, I will come often and I will visit you. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can't understand what's happening here. And she turned and she walked out the door and I looked and she never looked back. And I never felt so alone and so lonely in all of my life. I didn't know that it was only the beginning and I didn't know that it was happening across the country and that it had been happening for decades and that for over a hundred years, 150,000 little children were taken from their homes, their communities, their families, the things that they were familiar with. I thought it was just happening to me and it was really, really was brutal. The first two or three years were brutal. All of the suffering and abuse and sense of loss was so pervasive. By the time I got out of there, 11 years later, and because of these feelings of abandonment and rejection and not being valued and not having any worth and standing at the uh, top of the steps in that last day that, was, that I was there, I looked out and I thought to myself, oh my God, I have nowhere to go and I have no idea what I will do with the rest of my life, none whatsoever. And you think about that, and many of you here have children who have graduated and gone on to universities and have uh, successful careers. Imagine what it might have been like if they were your children and they'd been put through this and spit out of this education system that absolutely destroyed every sense of human dignity that they had. No hope for the future, no inspiration, And then you sort of get an idea of why we have inherited the condition we have inherited in Canada together. We see the huge disparity between our communities. We, we see these horrific stories on television about our young people taking their lives. We see images of the crushing poverty and there's just so much hopelessness and despair in our country, as rich as it is, a free nation, a democratic nation, where justice and equality should be matter of course. And in our country, it isn't so. I, I know that rings with sadness but I still stand in this moment with you and I think about all of the possibilities that we can bring forward to make things different so that every child born in this country, every child feels loved and wanted and cared for and they belong and they're part of us, part of we. It's not so at the moment. And I keep looking to these more than eight out of 10 Canadians 
who have said that they care. You're in this room, many of you. Many of you have heard the stories. And we're trying to wrestle now with the most obvious question. Well, now that we know what we know, and we care, and we want to do something, and we want to reconcile what it is, what is it that we do? Uh, some, some of the answers are really obvious. I was at a, a meet, uh, gathering like this the other night, and uh, I was a speaker, of course, and one of the responders got up, and uh, they quoted uh, a Christmas carol by Charles Dickinson, and he thought that was appropriate. And in that, in that uh, carol, I guess, it must have said, I don't know anything. I never did know anything, but now I know that I don't know. That's probably a good place for all of us to start, right? It's the same for me. I don't know you. I don't know other people. And I think it's really important for us to begin to know each other. For the first time in our lives, sit down and have a discussion or a chat with someone and ask yourselves, who are we? <clears throat> and you'll find that you'll be excited to tell who you are. Nobody has asked you who you are, but now we should be asking that. And when we begin to tell our stories, all of us in this room, we begin to discover that common humanity that threads us all together. And we begin to recognize that, yes, we do have a responsibility to each other, to care for each other, to learn that word. I heard the word this morning, love, at the heart of reconciliation, the essence of reconciliation is this word, love. First, loving yourself and learning to love others. And, and really that's what it means in reconciliation too. If we're going to be talking about reconciliation and bringing about reconciliation, then it really should be a core value, a continuous way of living for us individually and collectively. A continuous way of living. So what do we do? How do we do that? Well, we should maybe wake up every morning and say, today I'm going to have a back pocket reconciliation plan. I'm going to maybe look at somebody I've never met before and say, how do you do, sir? Or just a kind, gentle nod to acknowledge their presence, their humanity, or maybe you're going to have a kitchen table dialogue with your family. Or maybe you're going to have in one of the church basements a dialogue circle inviting all of our different groups of people to talk about who we are as Canadians. So this gentleman that I was talking about, he said in response to my talk, he said, it seems helpful to me that as a beginning point, the work of reconciliation is furthered when those of us who come from colonizing countries shut up for a while and listen. That's probably good advice. I hope nobody's offended. But just really learn to listen, right? The work of reconciliation is furthered when we make room in our mind and heart for the stories of our First Nations brothers and sisters. The work of reconciliation is furthered when we don't claim to know too much. Perhaps our first step is to know that we don't know anything about what that experience would be like to be colonized. The experience of losing ancestors to smallpox, the experience of the introduction of alcohol, the experience of residential schools, the experience of broken treaties, 
treaty after another, the experience of a culture and language and, and, and religion discredited, the experience of having your identity almost erased, how could we know that that's all, what that is all about? Most of us can't. And he's speaking for us, for you. That most of, how could you? And so that's why we need really to begin to have these new kind of dialogue, deep discussions that transforms our relationships. And then we begin to actually do things where we live, where we work, and where we play. I think that all of you in this room, whatever you do, should think about adopting reconciliation as a core value and a way in which you live by continuously, that would be so helpful. In, in British Columbia, we started a small uh, organization called Reconciliation Canada. Uh, the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission had just early, uh, had just started early on. And uh, we wanted to make sure that they weren't flying under the radar, so I got together with uh, one of my daughters, and I said, Karen, we have to find a way to try and elevate the profile of the commission when it comes to do its work in Vancouver. And I said, I want us, I want us to have a big walk in, in, in Vancouver. I said, 50,000 people will come to this big walk. And the symbolism of that is that Canadians care and of course she was feeling sorry for me because she didn't know whether I was gonna live or die. I was wrestling with cancer at the time and I was in the hospital and she said, Dad, I promise we'll, we'll have that walk. So in seven months from the time I asked her to do that and to the time of the commission coming to Vancouver, we organized the walk and 70,000 people came out in the pouring rain. And I knew. Oh. And I knew then, I knew then that many, many more Canadians than we know care about doing something about our history that we've inherited together. And when I come to meetings like this, and I, I'm inspired always that there are people here in this room who have brilliance, who have heart, who really care and want to do whatever they can, and that's really important. You have to do whatever you can to promote reconciliation. This, this fine gentleman that wrote these notes for me, I got one more quote of his. I really loved his response, not because he was responding to me, but I, th I thought because it was so important. But anyway, he was saying that reconciliation can be grand. It can be something about a big event like 70,000 people walking together or eight to 10,000 people gathering at the Pacific National Exhibition Grounds to be a part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission event in Vancouver. And he said, but maybe it's about a million other little things that ordinary Canadians can do where you live. Maybe, maybe the accumulation of these million little things is more profound than all the big home runs that we can create around reconciliation. So what I'm really saying is that everybody, absolutely everybody in this room can contribute to the idea of reconciliation and the idea that we can transform our country to something better. And I know what's been driving Canadians. I know that prior to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and prior to the acknowledgement of our history, colonial history with our Aboriginal people, I know that we felt as Canadians that we had some values that we lived by, and I've mentioned them before. Equality, justice, all those fine, wonderful things and I know that Canadians still want to live by them. 
and, 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 and this foundation is one of the foundations that works hard to try to hold us accountable for doing those things. But now we need to grow that out so that all Canadians every day, everywhere, wherever they live, continue to strive for this harmony, this peace and harmony that we need between us. I think that when we are reconciled, we will know. And one of the things I learned at that walk, by the way, Dr. Martin Luther King's daughter was her Bernice King, Dr. Bernice King, and she said, every generation has to fight for its own freedom. Every generation has to struggle for its own freedom. It means then that reconciliation is never whole or full or complete. It's a continuous journey from generation to generation. Our job here today is to do our very best in promoting reconciliation and harmony and justice and love among all of us so that when the time comes, we pass it down to the next generation and they're ready to nurture their time and their place in this great country. So I want you to think about this. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, do it for 30 days at least. Maybe you'll get the habit. Create a back pocket reconciliation plan of some kind. Yeah, you know what, I'm gonna do that. Maybe it'll start just for fun, but you'll find out that it will have deep, deep meaning for you. In fact, it will change the way you see yourself and the world around you. It'll begin to affect others. So do that, adopt reconciliation as a core value and that it is a continuous way of living. The worst thing, the worst thing that can happen, absolute worst thing can happen, is you, if you just leave this place today and never think about that again, that would be so tragic. But I, I have faith that people in this room and people across this country are gonna carry this work forward. And I know that the uh, TRC has 94 recommendations. I think all of you should become familiar with those that may be appropriate to you wherever you live and work and play and help to bring about the resolution to those uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, we have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Those are, it's, a, it's a statement that articulates the minimum standard in which uh, um, Aboriginal people should exist. No different from what we expect as Canadians as minimum standards, so use those and use those as guide. And read, read all the material you can, talk to survivors, talk to others about our, our, our history together, have those dinner table discussions, have church hall meetings, but bring each other together and so that we can begin to dialogue and begin to create a society to which we truly will be proud of. This is, Canada is a great country. We all now have a right to be here. Nobody's going away. So the next best thing is to find out how do we live together. Thank you.